Hi, everybody, and welcome to the John Meyer Podcast. Today's topic is about scaling smart and automating Snowflake with DevOps discipline. Joining us today is Amir, the CTO of Yuki Data. Amir, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, John, thanks for having me. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, man. How about yourself? I'm good. See, it's just like uh, allergy season, so my voice is a little bit funny, but I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little funny, and here we are doing a podcast while bringing you on the show for it. So we're going to try our best, but you're coming across great. And Amir, I'm going to jump right into it. And I want to talk about your approach to resource management and cloud data platforms like Snowflake. Okay. Uh, so I think that when we're talking about uh, management of data clouds, we can separate it into two areas. Uh, we have the maintenance and we have the development of new use cases. When we're talking about uh, maintenance, we can separate it also to two areas. Uh, one is maintaining the data. You need to fix issues. You need to fix your tables that are problematic, that are showing incorrect data. Uh, and the other maintenance, uh, which is kind of sucks, which uh, all the infra management and making sure that, you, that your uh, servers are in the right size and all of the queries are working perfectly. And actually, in my opinion, the most important thing is to focus on developing new use cases and focus on managing the data and not the infra, because that's the only thing that bring an actual value to the organization. Uh, so that's actually where I think teams should focus on and let other tools to uh, maintain all of their infrastructure. Amir, I got to ask you, how does Yuki fit into this? So, of course, I'm a little bit biased, uh, but in our approach, uh all of the teams are doing kind of the same things when you're talking about infra. They are looking on their history or on their query history and try to optimize the server size. If they have performance issues, they are increasing the size. Uh, if they have performance issues, they might like even... Uh, increase the cluster size and they're always solving the problems with money but it's not always the solution because uh in some in extreme scenario will you will get to either a budget limit or you have such a problem with the performance that money is not a solution you need to rethink and you basically need to restructure your entire infrastructure. And it's something that is really hurtful for organization. We work with uh, a company that spend a full quarter with 10 engineers just to restructure their entire infrastructure. And it's something that is really hurt. They didn't develop any new use cases and it was their only solution because their queries were running super slow they didn't uh, uh, run in the SLAs that they need uh, and it's something that they need to ca take care of and we're doing it automatically and that's what we want to solve in Yuki basically take all of the generic work that data engineers are doing and do it automatically for them on their snowflake on their data bricks and all of the other data clouds so Amir, you're analyzing or you're looking at the metadata from Snowflake and saying, hey, listen, you need X amount of, and, and, and I love the analogy, and we talk about this so much of T-shirt sizes for servers and instances or clusters. You need a small server to run this query on, or you can run X number of servers on or queries onto these servers. You're looking at the metadata of this query and defining the server cluster or instance that the query should run on for the best optimization. Exactly. When we are thinking about what's the perfect environment looks like, uh, we're imagining that Every query is go to the optimal warehouse, small queries to small warehouses and big queries to the bigger ones. And that's what everyone are trying to do. And we saw that if we're looking on the metadata of the queries, it's enough to route them to the optimal one. Because what is mainly uh, increasing uh, the runtime is when you're uh, scanning more data, or you have a complex query. That's the only two reason. And what we're doing is we're looking on the metadata. We're not scanning the SQL text. We're not scanning the data. We just look on the metrics that all of the queries have, and we know how to route them to the optimal warehouse in real time. And by that, we have 
the optimal environment. Amir, it sounds like you're really being security conscious. And I, ha- I want to jump into is how are you balancing not only the security and the performance when you're working with sensitive enterprise data? So we are working with big companies that are very sensitive for, for the data. And in order to support their business, uh, we had to install our services in their cloud environment. We're not talking about data cloud, we're talking about their AWS account, uh, GCP, whatever. Uh, and we are deploying our solution in their environment. By that, we're making sure that all of the queries and all of the data that is coming from Snowflake is staying inside the organization. And by not looking on the actual data or SQL text, because sometimes it contains PII like emails or phone uh, phone numbers. And by doing that, we are making sure that all of the data is staying in one place. Amir, it feels like Yuki Data is like the Kubernetes for data management platforms. It's managing the infrastructure. It's managing how it's going to optimize not only the queries, but the environment and the cost around it. Yeah, uh, we took inspiration from from the DevOps area because the real problem in the data clouds is that data engineers have to do DevOps work. like how to do load balancing in real time for millions of queries over all of the warehouses in Snowflake. It's a big problem, but it's something that has already been solved in the past on EC2s in AWS. So we took a lot of approaches from the DevOps side and implemented it in the data engineering side. Have you faced any interesting technical hurdles when actually creating this middleware for the data systems? So much. Uh, Basically, when you're building this middleware, we have to make sure that it's speaking native, Snowflake natively. You have a lot of requests. You have query requests. You have monitor requests. You have login requests. Someone wants to refresh their token. That things that data engineers don't even notice them because Snowflake are doing it everything behind the scene. So we had to make sure we, we are dealing with all of the requests that Snowflake can handle. And the most important thing, data engineers and organization, when they are working with Yuki, they don't have to change a single line of code. And the only way that we can do it is when we're building a middleware that managing correctly the sessions and the queries, making sure that every query that is being uh, sent through Yuki will get back to the customer. It's something that Snowflake is promising and we have to promise that as well. So it was really challenging but we spend an entire year with all of our developers in order to build a really robust solution that it can also deploy it in your AWS environment, which is also a big thing to, to build. Amir, is there any performance impacts or technical solutions that's actually burden or take the burden off of end users? It's a good question because it's not a magic. Eventually you have a middleware uh, that reroute your queries. Today, we're only talking about milliseconds. That's all it uh, adding to a request. And we need to remember it's mostly data warehouse uh, used as a data warehouse. So you have reports that are running a few seconds. So the milliseconds that we're adding are not really critical. Amir, I want to jump into a little bit more around the DevOps perspective. We know when you go to cloud, a lot of the DevOps own their infrastructure, own the deployment of their infrastructure. Have you seen any practical steps where the DevOps teams doesn't own or control their infrastructure and how this has been implemented? I think we saw so many use cases. We saw uh, data teams that have a dedicated DevOps. Uh, We saw companies that implemented uh, Snowflake in their production. So it means that the DevOps are in charge of the, on the Snowflake environment and the R and D is taking care of all of the data. So you have different organizations with different needs. Uh, I think that's something that is work for everyone is building a monitoring that is dedicated for their own company. I think that when we're trying to build a unified solution for everyone, we are always thinking about what uh, all of the DevOps and all of the data engineers are looking at when they want to check their performance and check their cost. And we're trying to build a unified system that give them 
all of these uh, dashboards and graph that they are building on their own. So one is go build uh, monitoring tools because it's really important. And the second one is don't afraid of automations. We use, uh, we're using uh, Snowflake because it's uh, working out of, the, out of the box. You don't have to do anything. But the most simple automation is reducing the server size during the weekends because most of the people are not using them and you don't need to have such large servers. So don't afraid from, uh, from automations. Do it. Do also monitoring. Make sure that your queries are really optimized because that's something that most of the companies can do. You are the only one in your organization that really knows your data, knows your tables. And if you want to optimize your queries, no one will do it, not even AI. Downsizing or reducing your server size over the weekends or not using isn't a new problem. We've been experiencing this since infrastructure, we've been utilizing infrastructure, whether it's been on premise or in the cloud. And I think we're just still saying the same thing of the reduction. How are we helping customers with that? So I think that there is no magic. You always have to balance between the performance and the cost. And the problem is that you're always doing it like retrospective. You, you're looking on your query story and then try to change things in order that it won't happen in the future. But in reality, things are changing. You have spikes, you have different uh, behavior for each day, for each hour, and you can't really analyze your last month and fix it for the rest of your uh, for the rest of the year. You will need to constantly monitor it. You will have to constantly create automations, and that's something that you will need to do forever. And you are doing it also in other clouds, not just data clouds. You're also doing it in AWS. DevOps are spending a lot of time in order to make sure that their environment are really optimized between performance and cost. So you need to do it as well in the data cloud. Automation is one of the biggest things and the key and trusting the platform that you're utilizing to do the automation correctly. The reason I mention that is because if you look at your historical trends on when you should scale up or down, it's going to give you 75%. And the reason I say 75% is it's going to give you your weekends, your nights, uh, holidays, things on there. The other 25% you can't predict. Because here's an idea, here's the thing, is if I am selling a widget, right, and my widget has always done this over a time, but all of a sudden it hit a social influencer and now my widget went up and spiked, there's no way to predict that data. To The only way to do that is to handle it through automation because it might hit on a weekend or night when I went down when I really should have scaled up. Yeah, so I agree. It's a big problem, but we need to separate it uh into two use cases. One is traditional data warehousing for internal, for like internal uh, departments inside your companies that are querying it through BI or their ID if they're sending queries. And if you have a problem there, it's not super urgent. Like you can increase the server size, everything will be okay. The other use case, which is more critical, is when you're uh, implementing Snowflake in your production and your customers are getting data from your Snowflake. And then if you have a widget and all of your customers suddenly enter the website and take the data from Snowflake, then you will have problem. And in that use case, you need to make sure that your environment is really scalable because if you're not taking care of it ahead and you are not making sure that you are load, load balance, you can load balance a million queries at once, it's a problem. Everyone are solving it for uh, APIs and things like that. You'll need to solve it for the other clouds as well. I'm not going to jump and say Duke is the solution, but uh, Yuki is the solution for that. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you threw it in there. And Amir, I like how you separated the two different types of data. Your customers who might be querying it, but then there's your internal users or the normal everyday users of the environment that it can scale periodically or when it needs to and it's not critical. Amir, where do you see some of this data infrastructure heading in the next few years? 
So I'm really excited. Like next week, I'm going to celebrate a decade in the data field. And I used to, and I took like the time to think about what I experienced in the last 10 years. So I started from SQL Server. I moved to Hadoop and then Elasticsearch and then Snowflake and Databricks and DuckDB. And all of that in 10 years. Like I remember when I started my first job, I saw someone that is an expert in SQL Server is working with it like for 20 years. And I think to myself, I changed so many technologies during the 10 years. Uh, but I think we are getting into a period which is going to be more stable. More companies will use solutions like Snowflake and Databricks. It's, gonna, it's here to stay. Uh, something that is going to change is, in my opinion, companies will have multiple platforms at once. They will have Snowflake, Databricks, DuckDB, BigQuery, all of that in one company. All of the data will probably sit in an S3 bucket, uh, managing with S3 tables, using Iceberg. And if we are, uh, when we are thinking about what we're going to do in the future, we'll have a different problem. How do we manage all of these platforms? Because I'm thinking to myself, I used to spend 80% of my day on just maintaining Snowflake. And if I wanted to work with Databricks, I had to bring a someone that is, uh, his specialty is in Databricks and he need to manage it. So we need to have a unified platform just for the management all on, of all of the data clouds. And after that, we'll get to somewhere like educate our users when they need to use each data cloud, when they need to use Snowflake, when it, when it's the right time to use DuckDB, if they have an application, for example. And what we are trying to build basically is the gateway for all of the queries inside the organization. We want to be uh, this gateway that is not just running your query on the best warehouse in Snowflake, we want to make sure that every query will get to the right data platform. We know how to send, if we need to send a query to DuckDB or to Snowflake or Databricks, we want to do it in real time. And we want to do it without interfering the user experience at all. Sounds like you've evolved in different products and services as the data platforms have evolved and you went to the next thing and you're really kind of immersing yourself into all these different data platforms my last question for you is, are you seeing any emerging patterns or technologies that you're really excited about here? So I started from Iceberg uh, because I think that after so many years, uh, they kind of solve these big problems that we had. When we wanted to work with multiple vendors, we couldn't do it. We had to copy the data for each data platform. I think that was like the mo the worst nightmare of organization moving between one data solution to another. And beside that, I'm thinking about ETLs. All the ETLs that we used to build in order to take the data from one place, which was an S3 bucket, to Snowflake or Databricks, we don't have to do it anymore. So you have more time of data engineering, focus on what's really important. And that's what I started with, adding more use cases for the, uh, for the company, supporting more departments, supporting uh, more features, uh, implement their solutions inside a product. And that should be their focus. And I think that Iceberg is really support this vision and this future. Amir, I'm really surprised you didn't mention AI in any of this. I'm the I mean, first one. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the first one who hasn't mentioned AI, and I think it's going to be natively built into all the applications, and it's just exactly. going to be part of your everyday life and utilizing it. I like you mentioned the ETLs and not having to build those or customize those to transfer your data from S3 to over to another platform. It's just natively going to be built in. Amir, I got to wrap things up and I got to thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John. I really loved it. Thank you. Likewise. Well, everybody, this has been the John Meyer Podcast. In today's topic, we were talking about scaling smart and automating Snowflake with DevOps discipline. Joining us today was Amir, the CTO of Yuki Data. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, and notify because guess what? We're out of here.